first part of this recording in progress. Like, well, I push the button or to record. That would be obvious. Is it recording now? Okay. So I'll give you that. Then I will announce in the beginning. Everybody on the screen. Right. Some people if have an objection to it. They can, they can opt out on their device. I'll try to be myself. I've got two years worth, of, almost two years of Zoom story. <laughs> the funniest ones were when we started in the early days of the pandemic and people were working from home. Some of them didn't understand that even though they were working from home and they were having employee meetings, you know, the corporate decorum applied. So mm -hmm. They were like their pajamas. And some were wearing this. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the dog would bark when the Amazon guy would come by. The dog would that each So they'd set up another inquiry and petition. You know, in my perspective, that's that's just comes with the territory. It, you know, it does. so it does. It, uh, it's very distracting. You want to see my son come and and you know video bomb? He loved that. It was like always on screen. Like, hey, yeah. Dad, what are you doing? <laughs> it, it's not. It's not unusual. Yeah. No. Not but you know, it I would. It, it fun. If it's become like acceptable for that, if you don't actually have to pretend that you're in an office and people are okay with it, I think it's good. Yeah. You know, it sort of breaks the barriers down though, because it's like the problem is in corporate America, it's really offended. Yeah, yeah. So if you show up in an undershirt, somebody's gonna be offended. But that's what I mean, right? Yeah. If you get used to it, yeah. if it becomes okay, you can argue about how that might lead to the degradation of American society or whatever, but yeah. Yes. You log in and just turn your sound off. Turn off your sound. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll be in like we'll have some time delay. Yeah. All right. So, I do. I think I bought this right before COVID, so I'm finally getting some. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'll keep that as a backup. Actually, does red show up? Barely. No, yeah. red, red takes you to go through rear projection. They won't do the power pack. I'm going to get two days out of it this morning. As long as they're not waving it at the people, it's good. All right. Well, we don't want you to get involved. Right. right. But it's so cool because it's like literally a pointer. You're being a lightsaber. Anyway, yeah, I can see that leading to trouble, though. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. especially with some right. people that gesture a lot. Exactly, exactly. You got to learn how to hold the laser pointer. Although most people here lecture, so I think we'll be fine. Right. So this really is going to make it. Okay. Yikes. Okay. That's my plan. I have more than 20 slides, but I talk quickly and I wanted to get through the stuff. So I think we'll do 20. Okay. Um, you can yell at me if you want. I mean, I'm totally I, I fine. Think it's fine. Whatever. I'm fine. Whatever. Yeah. Okay, I have a lot of tell me when I've got, tell me when 20 minutes are off. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just get closer and closer. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Is this a good volume? Yeah. Want it closer? <laughs> Two part ones. What do you mean? Because it's Roman? You know? Oh, what? Yeah. Oh, you're asking why? Yeah, because uh, I gave a talk in April and this is part two also. I'm not making this up. I'm just, this is part two. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a different talk. I mean, it's not. 
that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm sorry. There, it's like it's like television. It's like television. Half of the show is going to be things you already saw. Maybe more, actually. So <laughs> that's how we that's how we budget. You know. Yeah, right now I'm sharing. And if I don't stop, you have to yell at me because I, yeah. I'm not gonna leave the room though, at least maybe until you're halfway through your talk. Yes, I was not going to, if you want me to, I will, but I didn't want to. No, All right. <laughs> It's old, actually. It just uh, my excuse is basically COVID made it take a long time to do all the the analysis, and it's not really all that exciting. So, yeah. Do I have food in my teeth? Oh man, that's what. Right? The masks are great. You don't ever have to brush your teeth, but the minute you start talking. <laughs> All right. On, on that note, we're I don't even to... know. I didn't check. Oh boy. <laughs> on that note, wait for a little bit. Huh? Uh, okay. Yes. Please come in if you're outside. I think we should start. Yeah. So this is the start of the afternoon session on um, topological supernativity part two. And first speaker is Nick Bush from University of Maryland to tell us about their findings on EV2. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to start by thanking the organizers. This has uh, been a lot of fun. Um, this is also my first in-person, whatever, group of physicists. So I apologize if I'm slightly awkward. OK, um, yeah, so uh, I was going to change the title. I was thinking about it. But you know, this is a topology and correlations um, workshop. So we should talk about both of these things in UT2. So, um, before I get started, I want to acknowledge the collab collaborators on this. I mentioned Sheng Ran, who was my postdoc uh, when this was discovered, and he's now at Washington University, St. Louis. We work very closely with J.P. Paglione's group, um, and there's a list of collaborators, including some people from Bryce. I don't know if he's here. No, it's okay. Um, and so this is what my talk is going to look like. So. Um, it's very difficult to actually do, uh, well, not just a comprehensive job, but even like a half decent job talking about everything that's been going on in 20 minutes. So I'm going to try to talk quickly. Um, maybe that's not a problem, but also try to cram as much or remind you about the big properties. And I apologize if you have a favorite thing that I skipped over, we can always go back and talk about it during discussion. Although I don't necessarily have all the slides for everybody. Okay. So, um, First thing, UT2 is a correlated 3D metal, all right? Um, what I'm showing here on the screen, let's just start in the middle, resistivity as a function of temperature. Um, so it's an orthorhombic system. So the three high symmetry directions, A, B, C, there's negative slope and the resistivity, a hump. I say this is typical of heavy fermion uh, resistivity. The C axis has this um, interesting temperature dependence. Uh, this may or may not be the same temperature scale. There may be something else going on. This is still being worked out. But um, just so you know, the absolute value of the resistivity is all comparable. And so we, you know, it's proper to think about this as a three-dimensional system, at least you know, as far as the electrons are concerned. It's not visco or even close. Um, it's also not like the transition metal dichalcogenides in case you need to be told that, right? So same chemical formula, different crystal structure, completely different physics. Magnetic susceptibility. Uh, a is here X. This is the easy uh, magnetic easy axis. B is the in-plane direction. So even though resistivity looks kind of comparable, 
Um, it actually has a local maximum. And then in the C direction looks like a mini version of this. And then if we're looking at uh, the specific heat, it's enhanced. It has a gamma value of about 120 millijoules per mole Kelvin squared. And if you just want to look at it in comparison to some of the other heavy fermion systems, it's kind of, it lives in that same ballpark. All right. And then electronic structure. So what I'm showing you here um, is uh, actually just DFT, actually for, for the pretend thorium compound. So if you ignore F electrons, it's supposed to look like it has tangular Fermi surfaces. Uh, our angle resolve photo emission actually shows you this on high energy scales. So you've got these very dispersive bands that cross uh, the chemical potential. By the way, if there are questions, I would much rather you raise your hand. If I'm paying attention, I'll, I'll choose you. I don't want to wait until the end and then kind of forget what I said. Um, so um, now this was done at 20 Kelvin. And so it's also a question of energy resolution, but there, um, there aren't really strong indications of F weight. If you're just looking at this, there is actually F weight at the chemical potential. Um, and then there's a sign of an additional pocket that does seem to be directly predicted by any of the first principles calculations. So that's, that's the best we know right now. And uh, optical conductivity from our friends at Hopkins um, shows that there's a very nice Druda behavior, especially below 40 Kelvin. And so this is proper to think about this as a heavy fermion, Fermi liquid compound. Okay, the superconductivity, um, these are you know, standard signatures, the first ones, and we'll talk more about uh, the specific heat uh, in the midpoint of the talk. So it screens, it's a bulk superconductor, um, and it does kind of what you expect. And maybe I'll just point out right now, uh, what started off as uh, one of the questions is, why is there so much residual heat capacity um, it, below the transit? And I got to stop walking here because it happens quicker. Okay, so when did we know that we had something a bit bizarre, even for a uranium compound? It's when we started actually looking in detail at the upper critical field, which is uh, plotted here on the left for the different directions. So A and C, um, large, but maybe can at least um, you know, be acceptable. The B axis, when you get to, let's say, 10 Tesla, and the, um, it stops moving, you say, there's something wrong with my magnet or my fridge. But um, at least in this sample, as best we can tell, this is an almost vertical um, HC curve, okay? So point number one is these are large and isotropic and the paramagnetic limit, the Pauli limit is exceeded in every direction. So this has to be a spin triplet or a really, 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 really weird spin singlet, but let's say spin triplet. Um, and now the second thing is that when you're looking along the B direction, you get at some point around 35 Tesla back into the normal state, okay? But this is accompanied by a jump in the magnetization. And we'll come back to this later. All right. And so if one then does a whole bunch more experiments and asks what's going on at high field, um, this is the field angle here. This is effectively a zero temperature phase diagram magnetic field here. So along the BS, there is this um, superconductivity. It's limited to a fairly narrow uh, range of angle. It ends here at 35, where uh, FP means field polarized, but there's a metamagnetic transition here. And as you go towards A, it's got this curvature and you go from B to C, it goes this way, but then surprise, there's a pocket of superconductivity on the other side at higher fields um, that was dubbed the Lazarus phase by the fine people at the mag lab. And I like that name. So it's re it comes back from the dead. So um, there it is. If we want to talk a little bit about the properties of the Lazarus phase, I'm sorry. Okay, um, it is characterized by this. So if you measure the magnetization, there's a jump. It's still paramagnetic. There are features in the resistivity um, that are associated with that. It extends out to fairly high temperatures, at least 20 Kelvin, then it kind of goes away. But I'm sorry? Is it saturated? No, it keeps going. It keeps going. It's not a very large number, right? Um, and I'll show you some data from other groups later. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's, there's a change in the magnetic ground state. Let's at least say that. Um, and this thing lives on the high field side of it. Okay, 
And so if one wants to look at a HC2 curve for that phase, here we go. So this is resistivity and this is, a ton of, this is probably proximity diode oscillator measurement, but um, both of these show here, resistivity goes to zero. It's got the right temperature dependence. If I plot this, TC looks comparable to uh, the low field state. Um, you know, it's always a question when you find superconductivity at these fields, what's going on? And so that's a, an open question. But if you don't care about that stuff and you just want to be, you know, spoon fed uh, a line, I want you to just compare the, um, you know, the temperature scales and the field scales of UT2 to basically everything else we know about. So having a 45 Tesla upper crit field, not such a big deal if you're a cuprate, right? But your TC is huge. Here on this plot, this is a delta function, right? TC is, is two, we're a little bit below two. Um, and so this is actually quite remarkable, okay? So it, it, even if you ignore topology, if you ignore everything, this is a weird material. All right, so uh, to sort of make contact with some of the theme here, and, and by the way, it's not like we weren't thinking about this time, but why do we want, what do we, what do we want out of this thing? Is there a question? I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. Many of these conclusions, yeah, that, that's a good point. So no, we don't have a direct measurement of the G factor, but it would have to be pretty small, right? In order yeah. for it to, right. That's what I mean when I say, if you want to make it a spin singlet, if you want to make a poly uh, okay, it, it has to be a pretty, a pretty strange, you need a mechanism to explain that. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Right, so we like ferromagnetic superconductors. Um, you're almost guaranteed to have some kind of topological states, then you get your Majoranas and then you can build a good. Um, so I will say it explicitly, this is not a ferromagnet and I had to skip a bunch of slides just in the interest of time, but we can at least make a checklist, say what kind of properties would we expect of a topological superconductor? Um, I argue you would want to show that you've got some kind of Carl surface states, break time reversal symmetry, and actually in order for this to happen, you need to have a two component order parameter. And so uh, quickly, um, so Vidya Madhavan's group um, did the STM measurements, um, and I will not claim that these are completely understood, but when you look at uh, step edges on the surface that have different directions, either up or down, you always get opposite um, uh, not sign, but you know, sort of mirror image tunneling spectra, and this is by definition chiral. Okay, the energy scale of this is correct for superconductivity. It goes away when the superconductivity is gone, and so um, this is a signature of something to do with the superconductivity. So this is chiral surface states um, with Kapitonik's group uh, curve rotation. So optical curve effect shows it turns on below TC. So there's a signature of time reversal symmetry breaking. And then um, the samples that we've been measuring uh, show double trends in the specific heat. This is a contentious issue, as some of you know, and uh, we'll talk about this coming up. But uh, I want to talk about the ferromagnetic part. Yes. Oh, these are just different samples. This one, this plot. S1, S2, S3, S4, just different samples. And so the statement here would be not just, hey, we've got more than one, but um, it, you know, the TC varies, but you still see this. And so we'll get to this, but it's not true that you need to be a low TC to have two superconducting transitions, strictly speaking. Okay. So um, evidence, albeit indirect, um, from um, USR, is that, um, so if you're looking at the uh, effectively one over T1, it's going as a power law that's consistent with SCR theory. So this suggests that the material may be near a ferromagnetic quantum critical point. There's actually a deviation at lower temperatures that is not understood. Uh, recently posted to archive uh, optical corrotation data um, are reminiscent of the critical state model, which actually, as I understand it, is very unusual for, for these kinds of data. Um, and they seem to reflect strongly polarized uh, normal cores or, the, you know, and, and so that's again, another piece of evidence um, in favor of a uh, ferromagnetic-like interpretation. Of course, uh, Peng Cheng is gonna talk about uh, the neutron data 
I assume, um, next talk. So uh, there will be a counterpoint to that. Okay. Um, there have been many order parameter suggestions. Okay. This is just a list. The kind that uh, give you time reversal symmetry breaking are of this sort. Um, they are nodal. And so um, that's the kind of our going understanding. There are, of course, some suggestions that there's a, it's not, but um, that's ongoing. Okay, so I mentioned specific heat. So since the beginning, in fact, there were discussions about what's going on with your sample. Why do you have what typically termed a large residual um, heat capacity or a large gamma? And that would say that basically, oh, we're interpreting this as an ungapped portion of the Fermi surface. I'm partly to blame because even when we wrote our first paper, it's a very, um, what should I say? It's a nice story to say about a half gapped system and you know, it's in, in inherently topological. But of course it's met immediately with skepticism because of history. And there've been other materials where uh, with time uh, quality has improved and that has gone down. I don't believe that that's actually strictly parallel happening here. It's also true that people knew from the old days how to make samples that are not superconducting. But it seems like if you get something like this, you're basically already get, if you got a superconductor, it's already a 1.5K system. It's not, you can make crummy ones that are, uh, have lower TCs, but they're not gonna look like this. Now, also there were many reports of, we only get a single transition. And then the first thing that we have to say is that it took a little bit of work to see the double transition. You had to, do, you had to do smaller temperature steps in your heat capacity measurements. So unless you're doing that, and I don't mean that people weren't, it's not sufficient to say that, oh, we don't see that. Okay. Um, so as of, you know, actually I would say our, our official story is as, as far as we keep repeating or following our own recipe, we can always get samples that have two transitions. It's not like some of them have one, and then we just pick the ones that have two. If you follow particular recipes, you always get two transitions. They don't give you three, they don't give you four. And so even, even, in a, even if you accept that you can get samples that have a single transition, which is true, um, it's not clear why you don't have more of, more of them if there's always this variation, if there's lots of pieces, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a sec. Um, Los Alamos was the first group to also state that they were getting samples that had second transition. And um, at the time, when they first announced this, it, it made a lot of sense. In fact, still does because under pressure, everybody agrees that there's more than one superconducting phase. All right, it's shown here. So this is from um, Grenoble and then um, Tohoku. Of course, they're collaborators and they publish everything almost together. So um, the point is that this phase diagram under pressure is well accepted. And in fact, if you look in field, there may be even more superconducting phases. Question is how do they connect back to ambient pressure? Okay. Do you expect because of this that you would also see two phases at ambient pressure? And back to Los Alamos, so I'm showing you here on the left, version two and version three of this archive. In version two, there is a phase transition that's here. And then in version three, they decided that it was not a, a real signature, okay? Um, that's all clear, okay. I'm not, I'm not accusing them of anything, but that's the, no, I'm serious, but that's, the story has changed. The story has changed over the summer. So it's kind of a fast moving discussion. Another thing that Los Alamos has shown is that if they take a sample and they cut it into four pieces, that the specific heat um, changes slightly here. And so they're then saying that this is evidence that the superconductivity is inhomogeneous. I don't wanna say all of it because this transition didn't change, but uh, the, general, the general statement is then, or the general inference is that this is proportional to volume fraction in some sense. That's a very hard thing to do from first principles because you really can't calculate what the specific heat should be, right? And say, I'm missing some, or this is indicative of 50% or whatever. So this is, a, this is a, an empirical statement. Now, uh, more recently, um, and they, they do claim now the title of this was single component order parameter. I am not sure that I would agree with that, but they're saying, hey, look at our highest TC sample. Um, it doesn't have this double transition. And by the way, the residual or the, the lower temperature specific heat is going down. And that's the current state of things, okay? Okay. 
Well, I am not suggesting anything. I'm just, um, I'm repeating, <laughs> I'm repeating um, and perhaps improperly or not incompletely what, what, has, what my understanding of what has been said. Um, I guess I would say if, if this goes to zero, you would not be looking for a second lower temperature transition, right? Okay. Key is this actually doesn't. So I don't think that it's, it's been um, excluded. Oh, well, I mean, if you get a calculation basically saying, if you have a perfect cycle, you get roughly two thousand It's an extrapolation. It is. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Say 100% what? Sorry. Oh, we, we already do. I mean, it, it's full screening, right? And oh, um, they're they're close enough that I wouldn't want to make too much of a stand because it usually vary, it, the splitting is about 50 to 100 millik. So you know, then it depends on what part of you know is it where you just uh, where it starts or you know. So that that's difficult to say. The perfect also, we have to, you know, we can't really say definitively, but, you know, it, it, it's, not com it's not completely different. We'll just put it that way. Um, okay, so is everybody, go ahead. <laughs> no, so this is actually, no, I was not at the, Los Al uh, at the Santa Fe workshop, um, but to the best of our knowledge, and actually as far as I know, Los Alamos is saying the same thing, uh, crystallographically, and with uh, you know WDS, EDS, any kind of measurement that's sensitive to um, you know differences in stoichiometry, that you can't tell the difference. So you think there's no value in that? Yes. That's what you've been taught to think, and I'm not saying it's wrong. But when you want to measure it directly with the tools that we have, you cannot independently say that. Okay. Does that also doesn't mean that the scattering rates aren't going down. I, I'm not saying that either, but um, I'm a proponent of being very careful about this because we rely on triple R and, and gamma and things like this too much instead of actually doing direct measurements. And so what I'm saying is that at least so far, people have been trying to do careful crystallography, can't tell the difference, okay? And we are spending a lot of time trying to grow the crystals in different conditions and try to actually figure out what's going on. So this is an open question. I would also argue though, uh, and, and um, we're getting, being recorded. So if a dirtier superconductor gave you a Majorana, I would take that over the cleaner one. Okay. <laughs> That's just my opinion. Um, I, I think they said that. Yeah, but actually, you know what? It's kind of, it's not dramatically better. It's not, there's a factor of two improvement, but once you're dancing around like 1.8, it's went up maybe by a factor of 10. So from like, I don't know, 40 to 50, if, I, if I'm not misrepresenting it. So it's not dramatically different. And remember the 1.6, the original one was only 30. So it's not, it's not like it went from 10 to 100 and suddenly everything's better. So these are small changes or at least uh, fractionally small changes. Okay, um, second thing is, and they don't show that here. And I'm not, again, not saying anything, but every sample that we know of shows an upturn, including from uh, other groups. And so um, the origin of this has been attributed to um, nuclear shock effect, for example, um, but it's inconsistent with thermal conductivity measurements, which suggests that there is no, that there are no itinerant carriers, okay? Nothing that can transport entropy. So our supposition right now, and it's yet to be demonstrated what this is, is that these are some localized now, maybe magnetic fluctuation, something like this, but we don't really know. Okay. So I wanted to talk, how much time do I have? Am I passed already? Oh, okay. Well, good. So we don't actually have, this is like soccer. I mean, football, right? You know, we don't know. <laughs> You're just guessing. We don't know when it's going to end. Okay. Well, shoot. All right, so I want to focus on this and talk about the pressure a bit, okay? So um, I just recall again, 35, right? So you apply pressure with the field along this direction. Uh, I'm really not doing it justice. This is not an easy measurement. You have to do pressure cell, and this is done in Tallahassee, but this is what the phase diagram says, okay? So as you apply pressure, 
um, this field polarizes this metamagnetic transition get, gets pushed down to zero above a critical pressure somewhere in 1.5 GPA range. Superconductivity is encapsulated by it, so it can't go past. This says FM, be a little bit more agnostic. There's some kind of long range order on the other side. Okay. Um, and these are sort of the conclusions here. I guess I would also point out that if you're just looking at the initial slope of the, of the uh, superconductivity, it really extrapolates some ridiculous values. So it's cut off, okay? It's not, it, it's not some kind of, it doesn't look orbital limited. So I want to focus then on doing pressure studies of this, which is the Lazarus phase, this special uh, angle between B and C. Um, I will all note that this was something that we just got in right before COVID hit. So we were very fortunate to get it done. And showing again here, uh, this is the tunnel oscillator resistance. So they're complementary measurements, um, slightly different angles of the samples with respect to field, just because they're sitting in the cell and you can't control that. Um, but what's going on in all cases is that as you apply pressure, this field polarized state gets pushed into lower and lower field. Okay, that's consistent. It actually has to happen because we already knew what happened along the other direction. Um, what's interesting here though, is if you're looking at resistance, that zero resistance state, above 45 Tesla, that's also pretty remarkable. Caveat is that this is actually probably two different phases, right? The resistivity is not sensitive to the order parameter, but um, just from a, you know, like a G whiz kind of uh, perspective, that's pretty cool. Um, okay, the same story though. So this, this metamagnetic transition is acting as an upper barrier for this phase, but actually it's acting as a lower barrier from this phase. And if you think back to the data that I showed you at ambient pressure before, I said this is an HC2 curve for the upper uh, transition. It's got a bottom that's defined by the metamagnetic step. So this thing is actually limiting the upper field of this and limiting the lower field of this. So it's the magnetic transition that is, is really like a hard barrier. It's a fence that the neighbors can't cross. Okay, um, I'll just, okay. And this is what the phase diagram looks like. So this phase actually extends out farther than the critical pressure. And I promised I would talk about the metamagnetic transition. So um, one thing that happens is that this is from um, a Japanese group that the A axis and B axis magnetization switch at ambient pressure at that field. Okay. So there's a step and then the magnetization of the B axis sort of takes over. Similarly under pressure, A and B switch. So it has, I, I would argue it kind of has to happen because this phase boundary is falling, right? So it doesn't matter how you cross it. Eventually the B axis has to be the easy axis. Okay, um, that's it. So I tried to, I won't say I tried to convince you. This is our argument. This is the checklist that we have a topological superconductor or something that, that, that's checking some boxes. There is a controversy related to broadly speaking sample quality or how many transitions there are. Um, but the pressure phase diagram at least so far is not that contentious. And also I'll just notice any students in the audience, if you're looking, if you're graduating soon and looking to do a postdoc, please come talk to me. All right, thank you. Uh, Nick, you went through that quickly. Can you clarify a little bit about your thermal conductivity? Yeah, or right. I'll try. Do you want me to repeat what I said because I said it too quickly or is there a, more of a question? Okay, so the red and the blue are UT2. This is niobium, so this is S wave. Okay, um, then you've got UPT3, which is one of the weirder um, field dependencies, and this is potassium iron arsenic. And so um, the field dependence of this looks unconventional. It looks nodal. Okay, so again, I have this. I have this picture here. It's a uh, it's a vestigial remnant of an earlier talk where I was actually focusing a little bit on the other measurements that support a nodal or the presence of nodes. So things like microwave um, uh, also, and, and just the temperature dependence of, of like NMR are also consistent with it. Um, Nick, just follow up on actually the last sentence you just said. Um, how firm is the conclusion about or, or in your mind, is there still some uncertainty as to whether there are nodes or it's really gapped? No, I, from the earliest days, now you could say about specific heat and your density temperatures, but from the earliest days already, 
doesn't look nothing looks exponential, I guess. And so NMR is suggestive of this. And um, yeah, I am, and I don't actually know in thermal conductivity, we also have this evidence. And in microwave, actually. Um, so I, there, there are a number of different measurements independent that are all suggesting that there are, are nodes and, in, and specifically point nodes. Um, so, you know, within experimental variation that you're allowed, it's not like we even have a controversy. Oh, I thought there were line nodes or something like this. So um, I, I don't think it's, I haven't heard anybody complaining about that too, too uh, loudly. So the, the issue of how much residual specific heat there, yes. That's still well, the, sorted out. In a point node system, I don't, you know, get, uh, C over T should go to zero. Um, oh, I'm not, I'm sorry. This plot is not to suggest that they're the same thing. Yeah, just. Can, uh, can I ask a question about the field induced uh, phase? So yes. you have this uh, funny angle of like 30 degrees. Yeah. So what, what is it for angle in the crystal structure? So Right, so... Um, you, is it in a certain plane or what's some... Well, a certain plane, I forget exactly what value. The 0 one, one direction somewhere in here. But this... 0 one, one. The 0 one, one. That's actually also the natural cleave direction. So it's not a completely crazy idea, but the extent of this is actually pretty wide. And okay. so... I, but for the magnetism, there is nothing special if you... Oh, that is correct. Uh, right. That's right. Okay. So... No, I don't know, actually. Yeah. I'm sure okay. Sorry. Uh, Nick, could you please show the, the pressure field phase diagram, uh, like your penultimate slide towards the end of the talk? Do you like this one? Or do you want the... Uh, the next one. one. Yeah, this one. I'm sorry. To, yeah. So in here, because since with this one quickly, the... What is the difference between the light blue, light green, dark green, the all four? Ah, I didn't lines. get to like, touch on this. Okay, on yeah, this is, uh, well, I'll show you. Um, I, 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 it was cut from the talk, but since asked, here we go. So um, it's, as far as we know, paramagnetic, okay? Normal, so not superconducting, um, but here are the data from, the, um, the diode oscillator measurement and the resistance measurement at 1.54. So in the region, that pressure range where it exists. And when you're looking at the, in particular, so this is the superconductivity, okay? Zero resistance state. But there is this thing that we labeled A, has a very similar temperature dependence. It obviously doesn't go to zero resistance, but there's something going on here that originally we thought might have to do with maybe some, you know, incipient quantum oscillations. Um, it's a bit bold to make that association. In particular, again, this is right against, one, you know, one over H for a reason. Um, it's almost periodic, but if we were to take this seriously, do I have it written here? Um, yeah, okay, I don't have it written. Um, the, a Fermi pocket that could be responsible for this. Uh, would be really small and not really justified. But when we're talking about theories or explanations for where we get high field superconductivity, one of the natural things to look for are lower dimensional things like Landau level superconductivity, perhaps, where the orbital limit would be suppressed or perhaps even, you know, reversed. So that's kind of the motivation there. So it has nothing to do with the, um, with the metamagnetic transition you showed earlier? Well, it, that, that, it that only does in the field. sense that it exists forgive me for scrolling so much, it only exists on this side, it only emerges. So, I, you know, if the question is, would it exist here? Well, no, but remember, this is a first order phase transition that is, you know, so I could suppose that it's here. I would actually, again, what I was saying before, I suppose that this really should, it wants to be here. It wants to be superconducting in this phase. It's just in the wrong magnetic state. But this kind of signature emerges in the several, the few data sets that we have on the side of the critical pressure. So, yeah. Okay. So, so, so that's a crystal has a mirror symmetry. Yeah. Uh, and so in, uh, have you done any uh, angle dependent measurement such that you can analyze whether the, the mirror symmetry is broken in the superconducting phase? Um, as far as we know, diffraction is giving us the same crystal structure. Are you asking about something separate from the atoms? Because that's related to you know what, what you can classify in the what you can classify in the points. 
So How am I classifying? Scar sorry, say that again. The, I mean, the nodal point. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. classification is entirely from the high temperature crystal structure, so the space group. Um, but as far as we know, it's preserved. And you know, I think function with all our data, and we've done neutron scattering at lower temperatures. There's nothing suggesting that there's a change. Yes. Um... Let's see if I can understand. You showed the heat capacity at low temperatures. That, I showed uh, a whole bunch of them. Which yeah. one? So, so <laughs> you sorry. showed a, a residual gamma yes. at low temperature and the heat capacity. I wanted to uh, pick up on that and then connect it with your thermal conductivity. Yeah. So you show the field dependence here in the thermal conductivity. I wonder if you have the low temperature thermal conductivity uh, in zero field. Yes. So I mean, is, I don't have it plotted. How does here, it so. scale with temperature um, in the field at low temperature? Uh, you know, I'm sorry. I, the gamma should be the same for the heat capacity if it's impurity induced. Right. My, oh, um, yeah, it, it doesn't agree. It doesn't agree with the specific heat. Okay. That leads to this statement. So, by the way, so this construction here is one that is made to subtract um a part of this of, of the specific heat so that you get an ent equal entropy um under the curve so this would be the putative temperature dependence of this part that does not contribute to the thermal conductivity but is extra okay i will also say and i didn't show this in field uh in field there's also an upturn and in some cases it looks like it grows stronger so it's yeah okay thank you Thanks, Nick. Thank you.